Welcome to Urban U. I'm Abby Ashola. And I'm Ari Goldberg. This month, we're coming to you from Queens College. And as always, we've got a ton of new stories from across the CUNY campuses, like right here. We'll tell you about a student who's created a successful business out of crafting sneakers, a professor who takes his students deep into the Ecuadorian jungle, and much more. But first, this month's For the Record is about one of our most recognizable entertainers, American icons, really, of the 20th century. His house and life are now part of the CUNY world. My address is 3456 107 Street, Corona, C-O-R-O-N-A, New York. That unmistakable voice is Satchmo himself, the legendary jazz musician, Louis Armstrong. And that address was indeed his home from 1943 until his death in 1971. Since 2003, it has been the home of the Louis Armstrong House Museum, administered by Queens College. Remembered today often for later pop hits like Hello Dolly and What a Wonderful World, and for his jovial personality in movies and TV, it can't be overstated how important his impact on the direction of American music has been. Recordings like his seminal Hot Fives and Hot Sevens in the 1920s almost single-handedly changed jazz from an ensemble showcase to a focus on adventurous solos. He popularized scat singing. And by adapting pop standards into his own style, made jazz accessible to a wider audience. One of the few black entertainers to be accepted into white society at large at the time, his cultural significance as an international superstar resonates to this day. When Armstrong's wife Lucille bought the house in 1943 for $8,000, he was already a star and could have lived anywhere. But he chose Queens. For all the famed 52nd Street and Harlem jazz clubs, it was Queens where many of the musicians lived. Lena Horne, Dizzy Gillespie, Billie Holiday, Count Basie, Ella Fitzgerald, all of them shared the borough at the same time as Armstrong. And he preferred the modest accommodations anyway. As he told Ebony Magazine in 1964, we're right out here with the rest of the colored folk and the Puerto Ricans and Italians and the Hebrew cats. We don't need to move out in the suburbs to some big mansion with lots of servants and yard men and things. What the hell do I care about living in a fashionable neighborhood? To this day, the house looks much as it did back then and is open to the public. Designated a National Historic Landmark in 1976, it is a time capsule of writings, music, and artifacts. As of last year, much of the memorabilia, housed at Queens College, has been digitized online. And there's so very much to explore that they're building an additional 14,000 square foot educational complex right across the street. So that the man and the music can continue to entertain and inspire for years to come. As Tony Bennett said, the bottom line of any country in the world is, what did we contribute to the world? We contributed Louis Armstrong. For the record, I'm Ari Goldberg. Good night. How does an all expenses paid study abroad trip sound if the destination is deep in the jungle of Ecuador? At Gutman College, it's quite popular. Donna Hanover has more. For the past five years, small groups of Gutman College students have gone to Ecuador in the summer and even lived in the jungle. Their leader, Gutman Science Lecturer, Derek Tesser. We are in Ecuador for three weeks. We begin on the coast where we do marine biology. We go whale watching. We go to an island called Isla de la Plata to see the famous blue-footed booby. Then we go to the Itapoa Reserve where we spend the time in the jungle. And finally, we end up in Quito where we're at high elevation and we explore the volcanoes. We see the equator and have more of a traditional cultural experience within the city. The eight-hour hike into the jungle is not for the weak of heart. The trip is full of adventures and new experiences, from hiking in the jungle at night, to walking in rain boots through mud up to your knees, to just living in the rainforest, bathing in rivers, and handling species that you've never encountered before in your life. The trip is part of a program known as Global Gutman, and the students rave about it. Jenna Boo Berry says she was thrilled to get back to the kind of nature she knew as a child in West Africa, Guinea. And the physical training before the trip was vital. Two days every week, 
we do physical training, we, we do lifting, we do like hike to make sure our legs are prepared. It really, really shaped me and got me ready. Giorbi Suero says hiking into the rainforest was awesome. You have to pass this bridge across a huge river and right after you could see the entirety of the jungle like in front of you because like it was kind of like elevated. It was just otherworldly. In the jungle, the students sleep in tents in a large open air hut that is their classroom during the day. And there's a stream out back for cooling off. How about discomfort or fear of creatures? I think our excitement numbed all the pain we got from the, the bucks things. And <laughs> honestly, when we saw the endangered snakes and also the spider monkeys, the brown headed spider monkey, we, we got goosebumps because there's only about a thousand of them left in the wild and the Itapoa Reserve has about, I believe, like 200 of them. Tesser says conservation biologists help the students stay safe. We don't send students out to go catch the species or catch the snakes with their hands. They're never going to be handling them that way. Uh, we have the students only handling the species once they're safely caught and under the supervision of the biologists and the scientists that are working with them. And they definitely get close to animals they'd never encounter back home in New York. One of the most unique things that we see down there are an animal called glass frogs. There are actually many species of them transparent. You can see through their skin, you can see their hearts beating, you can see their stomach when you flip them over and look at them. These are a really unique species that don't exist anywhere else on the planet. But I looked at it, I touched it, but I never hold it on my, like, my hands, but it's really beautiful. And then there are the night hikes. We take night hikes through the jungle at night to find some of these species. We will catch them, we bring them back to the house, and we do photography to raise awareness about some of these really unique species that only exist in this region. Back home, Derek Tesser is also working on a PhD at City College of New York using satellites to study the city's water supply up in the Catskills. They're radar-based satellites, which actually have an ability to see through clouds, they can see through rain, and they can detect water content and vegetation. In South America, companies have destroyed much of the rainforest to plant crops they can sell, and this loss hurts the world climate. Most students come home committed to saving the rainforest as scientists, lawyers, or activists. The students become close friends, partly because they have no Wi-Fi in the jungle. At first, they think they can't live without their cell phones, but one of the things that we hear from the students that's most important to them is they're able to just disconnect. It made me um, think about and appreciate people who are around me. We sat down every hike, every night on the table. We talk about background stories. We talked about our experience, our family thing. It was really, and we bonded a lot. How did they feel about those night hikes? There was um, tarantulas in, in the night hikes. They're like, oh, you see the glowing dots there? Those are spider eyes. <laughs> and, and we were like, oh, we, we had to stay away from those. And <laughs> the night hikes were kind of exhausting because we were already hiking throughout the day. So it was, it was like your choice if you wanted to go to them, but we went to them anyway, because we were just like so like pumped, like, yes, we're finally here. It was surreal. I'm Donna Hanover for Urban U. Jan Kaminsky is an assistant professor at the CUNY School of Professional Studies for General Nursing, and her mission is to pave the way for better care for the LGBT community. Mary Evami has that story. I became aware of a huge knowledge deficit among physicians, nurses, other healthcare providers. They wanted to be able to know how to properly speak to and treat LGBTQ patients, but they didn't have the terminology, they didn't have the confidence, they didn't know how to create a warm and welcoming environment, even though they wanted to. That's when Jen and her wife started Rainbow Health Consulting to help healthcare providers treat LGBTQ patients in ways that could eliminate the health disparity that the LGBTQ community is faced with. Some of the health disparities that we see range from uh, mental health concerns, for example, um, uh, LGBTQ patients have a higher rate of depression, anxiety, suicidal ideations, to issues like substance use and abuse, and that's kind of just a, a tiny start. The majority of healthcare providers recognize the deficit in knowledge and are eager to learn, starting with terminology. 
They want to be open to when their when their patient comes in and says, "I'm pansexual," or whatever they might be saying, oh, "I'm gender fluid." What does that really mean, right? And so we spend a lot of time talking about terminology, vocabulary, definitions, and then they want to know what does this mean for my patient care. And the appropriate way of communicating can make a huge difference in how the patient shares crucial personal information. If they feel comfortable coming out to their provider at the beginning of a care interaction, that could mean that they could be diagnosed with, for example, like we've talked about, um, depression much earlier. So imagine you're a 16-year-old patient, you're going into your pediatrician's office that you've known since you were a baby, and instead of the pediatrician saying to you, oh, Susie, do you have a boyfriend yet? That's gonna make a, a, a lesbian young woman probably shut down and be embarrassed, not wanna talk. But if the pediatrician says, oh, Susie, are you dating anyone? You know, keeping it open, something like that, so simple. That helps to create an environment in which Susie can just say, actually, yeah, you know, I'm actually dating this girl and so and so and so. And then the physician can say to that person, okay, great, are you thinking about safe sex? Are you thinking about, you know, emotional health? Are you thinking about whatever the specifics are? Jen is also making sure knowledge on healthcare for the LGBTQ community is taught in school and is creating a curriculum at the CUNY School of Professional Studies. I'm going to be combining what I've learned outside of CUNY with Rainbow Health and with some of the work that we do with the student um, needs and knowledge level that we see here at CUNY. Again, the students are very eager to learn about these issues. Most of them work in New York City. They see patients of all kinds all the time and they want to know how to work with diverse patient groups. I've only actually been at CUNY for two years, and it's been a very special place for me already, um, because mainly because of the students. Um, I feel, I'm gonna get a little like emotional thinking about it, but I feel so fortunate every day to work with students from around the world who are coming to us from every background, every age. So they come with a variety of experiences, cultural background, religious background, and it is so beautiful to see the way that they interact. And I feel like I learn so much from them every day because they open up to us as faculty in a way that I feel very privileged to, to see. Um, so CUNY for me is about the students, it really is, and what the students do to make this a really vibrant urban university, yeah. I'm Mari of Amy for Urban U. Baruch student Eric Connor knows a thing or two about repairing old sneakers. But once the young entrepreneur taught himself how to customize new kicks, his small business became one sought after by celebrities. I visited him at his Brooklyn workspace to find out how he lures in sneakerheads searching for the most unique pair. So I was in Soho and I seen somebody wearing my shoes. They didn't even notice me at first because I didn't really start showing my face on my Instagram until I hit 10,000 followers. But I was like, where'd you get those? And they were like, oh, I got them at, uh, from some kid Econ Customs. I was like, yeah, oh, that's me. <laughs> my name's Eric Connor. I go to Brew College and I minor in graphic design and major in entrepreneurship. So what I do is I take authentic designer bags or exotic fabrics and take them and repurpose them into sneakers, AirPod cases, watch bands, lighters, rolling trays, pretty much anything that's an accessory. Connors is a part of a new generation of custom designers who evoke the work of Dapper Dan. The Harlem native pioneered using high-end logos like Louis Vuitton for his original designs worn by hip-hop artists from the 80s to the 90s. I have done so many celebrities that you start forgetting who you've done stuff for. Connors found his own success among artists of today. His list of celebrity clientele includes rappers like Blueface and pop stars like Justin Timberlake all while working out of his parents' spare bedroom in Brooklyn. Prices for his sneakers can run from $250 to $2,000. I was fixing sneakers at the time, so my Instagram name was Sneaker Hospital. I'm really doing surgery on their sneakers. I'm cutting the checks off, I'm pulling stuff out, I'm replacing it. It's like going and getting a new hip. <laughs> the money difference from customs and restorations was a very big gap. So I was like, I don't want to paint sneakers the whole time that I'm doing this. I bought this machine and had no idea how to sew it all. So after the first month, I was like, I really am really bad at this. But I was just like, I need to just keep on trying. So I would try little like techniques. Like I would put a little leveler right here on the machine so this way it can go and uh, 
keep a stitch straight. And it took me about three years to finally like get it to the point where I was like, all right, this is a straight stitch. This is what people want to see. After I learned how to do the straight stitch, the hard part was learning all the curves. Everything that I'm making is pretty much artwork. This is my way of expressing what I think stuff should look like. I use all authentic materials, so I'm chopping up like their real bags. I'm going to the store paying retail sometimes for half these bags. Just try to keep it where I'm not copying anybody's products. I'm just doing my own. I actually just did that collaboration with Kooji and New Balance. I'm looking to collaborate with other brands, trying to make my brand uh, its own entity and bigger. Just new adventures. <laughs> Abby Ashola for Urban U. You know what the sad part is? I make all these shoes for all these other people, never make for myself. I have like 10 pairs. Every time I make a pair for myself, you know what happens? Somebody comes into my house, says, I'll pay you double what you want for it. At our CUNY TV station, we love when our student interns have an idea for a story themselves. So when our intern, Rafael Lopez, who goes by Panda, told us he had an idea for a segment, we knew we were going to see something unique. Now you guys can see it too. Next, we profile Francine Perlman, a very special artist from the City College of New York whose work connects to activism and social justice. Judith Escalona met with her. Francine Perlman defies labels. She's an artist, sculptor, activist, writer, computer programmer, a classic Renaissance woman who always dreamt of attending the City College of New York. That dream came true years after graduating from Cornell University. But for decades, she already had been exhibiting work and had a portfolio to prove it. The then chair of the art department at City College was impressed. I went there with a portfolio of three-dimensional work and I went, I had a portfolio of drawings and I thought that's what I was gonna do. And she looked at both of them and she said, can you start on Wednesday? So in 2004, Perlman officially became an MFA student specializing in sculpture at the City College of New York. I didn't know whether I wanted my MFA or whether I wanted to have gone to City College. I had friends who went to City College and they were activists and they were really into what was happening in the contemporary world. Academics and activism, that's what attracted Perlman to City College. Her large wooden sculptures resonate politically, though she is somewhat limited by her current studio, which is really the apartment she lives in. That wasn't the case at CCNY. It was really great because we had our own studios, they were big enough, we had uh, a review at the end of every semester, so you just couldn't sit there idly. Perlman's master's thesis was called Bayit, the Hebrew word for house. It's a huge, sprawling structure. This is just the center of it, and it gets bigger and bigger. Each layer is another one, four of those holding on, then four more holding on, then four more holding on. Perlman shared another large work that explores domestic violence. When you went inside, there were works by women who live in domestic violence shelters. In a group show at the Edison Price Gallery, Perlman addressed the issue of animals threatened with extinction. Artists were invited to come here and dig our hands into barrels of scraps, cutoffs, leftovers that, are, uh, that result from the making of their lights. 
and it took me a really long time to think of what to do with it. But finally, I realized that the very idea of it being scraps and leftovers would be the theme of my piece. And then I heard from the Wildlife Conservancy online about the 10 most endangered species on Earth. And I thought, that's really the story of this piece. Perlman is neither independently wealthy nor a starving artist. She sells some work and teaches. But she's also a budding writer. Her blog is accessible through her website. Perlman volunteered with Al Otro Lado Border Rights Project to defend the rights of Latino migrants. Here's an excerpt from her blog. Narima came on the last day I was there. She was about seven or eight. She got it that my Spanish wasn't really solid, so she supplied the words I needed. At one point, I went out of the room for 10 minutes, and when I came back, she had painted this message for me. I will miss you very much. Perlman's blog reflects back to those student days filled with academics, art, and activism that made her the woman she is today. When you asked before what my title is or something, and I said artist, I think labeling myself doesn't work that well. I want to feel free to do whatever I want to do. And wherever my ideas take me or my heart takes me. Yes. Judith Escalona, Urban U. Undergraduate classes are often taught by graduate students, but how do graduate students learn to pivot from being students themselves to teachers? I want to see how CUNY does that. Teaching has made me a better student, and I don't see that conflicting with my studies, but actually just making me a better, stronger, more disciplined, more knowledgeable student, and more open-minded in many ways, and I think that's phenomenal. Samantha Bartholomew is a PhD student at CUNY's Graduate Center. She is studying criminal justice, focusing on the prevention of violence in her native Brazil. As a PhD candidate, she is also a teacher herself, a graduate teaching fellow at John Jay College, and she is one of hundreds who've come through CUNY's Teaching and Learning Center. Knowing that this would be a college where, as a doctoral student, I would have the opportunity to teach, that was a big factor for me in deciding to come here. So now, actually being in the classroom, even though that first moment was like, whoa, how am I gonna do this? It lasted very little. Now I feel that this is where I'm supposed to be. I, I'm, I'm meant to be teaching. Like at many universities, graduate students will teach classes. But what most universities don't have to prepare their graduates for is the sheer scale, both in terms of geography and demographics, of teaching at the largest urban university system in the country. And that's where the Teaching and Learning Center, or TLC, comes in, and its summer institute, it's a very intensive, full three days um, of work together that's focused on building this foundation uh, upon which they can grow. They learn how to speak in front of an audience. Um, they learn how to design writing assignments. They learn how to scaffold a body of knowledge over the course of a semester. While the intensive Summer Institute is certainly a highlight, the resources at the Learning Center are year-round. In its fifth year now, the staff offers support for graduate students in everything from career advice to teaching strategies. It was like, how did you transform those ideas that you have into practice in the classroom? And how do you deal with challenges that come up? And how do you do that with, in a healthy way? And you take every challenge in the classroom as an opportunity to learn with your students and do better for next time. We do a lot of work to kind of uh, demystify the college classrooms, right? You may have a 45-year-old grandmother in your class, and you may have an 18-year-old straight out of high school. You may have people who work full time. You may have people who are going to school full time, um, and we help them. We help them picture this, um, and that translates for our students into a sense that yeah, I can do this. Now, preparing teachers to teach may sound like a no-brainer, but historically, this wasn't always the case across academia, with PhD students often more or less being thrown into a classroom, sink or swim. And this is the experience for folks in my generation of graduate students. And it's not tenable um, if we really care about what happens in the classroom. And that's really the point for the Learning Center, caring about what happens in the classroom. There are over 20 campuses and dozens of majors across CUNY, and these graduate students are gonna be teaching at plenty of them. So instead of everyone kind of being left to their own devices, having a more unified support hub like the TLC and its Summer Institute, supporting 31 doctoral programs, means having a more unified approach to good teaching across the whole school system. 
And that's not just talk. CUNY PhD students teach about 180,000 students a year. To put that in perspective, that's equal to over 2% of the entire New York City population. I mean, that's a profound, profound number. And to think about the impact that one institution has on the life of the city, I mean, that number's just, just mind-boggling. If you're a student, uh, and you're a teacher and you need support in any way, there's no shortage of options. So uh, it's really important that people know you're not alone. Well, that is our show for this month. For more information on any of our stories, check out our social media pages. Before we go, here's something fun. So Kevin Bacon's brother, Michael Bacon, is a composer, an Emmy-winning composer here at Lehman College. And the Bacon brothers, they play music together. We're going to leave you now with a new song from them called Play. See you next time. Bye. People tell me love's a thing to work at. Gotta work, work, work to keep that thing alive. I hear what you're selling, I don't buy that. Cause I keep my work to